In this video lecture, I'm going to talk about the correspondence bias, which is also sometimes known as the fundamental attribution error. Although, as we'll see, uh, there are some differences between these two uh, versions of the theory. Uh, and I'm going to start with uh, talking about uh, some of the research by Daniel Gilbert. Um, I ask you to read the article by Gilbert and Malone, where Gilbert talks about um, the overarching aspects of the theory, but I actually want to get into a couple of the experiments so that you can see uh, really how that works. And I think that um, you know what Dan Gilbert has done here in his research and his theorizing about the fundamental attribution error is really very, very interesting and it fits together really nicely with some other uh, theoretical orientations within social psychology and we can see how it works uh, in the real world to some extent. And so uh, this particular article has several different experiments within it and I'm going to talk about one or two of them. Uh, consider the following statements. Armadillos may be lured from a thicket with soft cheese. Now on the surface it sounds plausible how many of us have ever had experience with armadillos? Probably not very many, unless you're from the southwest portion of the United States. I mean, I've seen armadillos on the road, <coughs> but I've never, never interacted with them. So I have no idea if they like cheese, let alone whether or not they can be lured out of a thicket using soft cheese. And do they, do they not like hard cheese, but only soft cheese? Are they some kind of snob that they only eat brie? Who knows? Uh, but on surface, the statement, although it's kind of nonsensical, it, it sounds plausible. It sounds like this is something that, uh, well, if, if it were made by somebody who had experience with armadillos, uh, this, this could certainly be true. Or how about this statement? The sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Now, for your position on the planet Earth, um, I mean, this is true. This is a taken for granted uh, statement um, and it has the ring of truth to it as well. But that's my point is that there's certain types of statements that we don't need to do any further reality testing on. They just sound like they're true. Woes unite foes. That's another example. How many experiments do you think have been done where the hypothesis is tested that woes unite foes? Probably none. I mean, what kind of data do we have on this? It, it sounds like it's true because it's been repeated so many times in different movies and books and uh, stories and so on. Uh, and it rhymes very nicely, so it has this ring of truth to it. But ultimately, we uh, have no way of knowing whether or not woes actually unite foes. I mean, what does it even mean? That people who are um, uh, hating of each other would unite if they, have, if they have a common base of suffering? You know, on, when I think about it more, woes unite foes really doesn't make any sense. I mean, why would I join forces with my enemy just because my enemy and I both have something like arthritis. It makes no sense. So, um, although it sounds like it's it's you know probably true, when you think more about woes unite foes, it's harder to see the truth in it. And if you said it in a different way, like this, woes unite enemies. Well, I mean that just sounds wrong. <laughs> but it's the same thing. It's exactly the same information but it doesn't sound as good. And so it doesn't have the ring of truth. How about this one? If the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. Johnny Cochran's famous statement that he used in the O.J. Simpson trial, leading to an acquittal of Simpson on the murder charges that he was facing. And of course, there was a lot more, uh, a lot more substance in the trial itself. But this is the phrase that goes down in history if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. I saw an interview with Cochran once where he said that he just came up with it on the way to the courthouse. It just came to him and he used it. Uh, and it, um, you know, it rhymes. It relates to the evidence in a nice way. 
You know, you got that glove that uh, OJ tried to put on, and for whatever reason it didn't fit. Whether the blood on the glove dried to make the glove smaller, or whether OJ was using something that would uh, uh, increase his water retention and thereby sort of bloat his uh, f feet and hands, so that when he tried to put on the glove, his hands were too big. Whatever, it doesn't matter. I mean, there are plausible alternative explanations for that, but the statement itself sounds so true. What if we, uh, what if we rephrase the statement and said something like this: If the glove doesn't fit, you must consider the weight it gives to reasonable doubt and conclude that my client is innocent. I mean, it's the same information. It's exactly the same information. Oh, this this one has a little bit more in terms of reasonable doubt, but um, the meaning is the same. Yet it does not have that ring of truth. You know, and if you think back to the lecture, the video lecture on social cognition, this is all about using system one and system two processing, in the um, terminology of Dan Kahneman. So if a if a statement has the ring of truth to it. Uh, you have a tendency to let it rest in system one. You don't go any deeper. You don't have to think about it. But when you're when you're faced with very complicated statements, then you use system two processing. And for any student <coughs> in grad school who has a lot of material to master, a lot of reading to do, you're just constantly, constantly working in system two. And this, of course, explains why you're so tired at the end of a day of lectures or the, at the end of a, a very long set of readings. System 2 drains one's mental energy, and we try to avoid using System 2. And so, you know, the statements that you have here, the ones that have the ring of truth to it, they're very easy to accept because you don't have to go to System 2. You can let them reside in System 1 processing, uh, whereas the, the very last statement here about reasonable doubt you actually have to think about what it means and that's system two processing. So it, it relates to all of that system one, what we're talking about here relates to all of that information from system one, system two processing. Uh, now as Gilbert and Malone explain in actually in several of uh, Dan Gilbert's papers he goes into this, uh, papers that he wrote around 1990, he's moved on to other stuff. You may know him as the um, uh, Prudential uh, investment uh, company spokesperson, which he was doing for I think about uh, seven or eight years. So they don't—they're not using him anymore. But he was—he uh, was on commercials quite a bit on TV, uh, and he's got a, you know, a different focus in his research now. But at any rate, um, you, you know, you can find TEDx lectures by Dan Gilbert online, but not about this stuff. I guess this is old hat, but I consider this to be his more important research. So one of the things that um, Gilbert noted in his various papers is that Descartes, uh, early on, in 1641, Descartes, the um, philosopher René Descartes, uh, put together a, a model of the mind. And this model of the mind essentially goes like this. So when people encounter a statement or proposition, as the mind encounters new information, they merely comprehend that information and they do not initially judge it to be true or false. They just rationally analyze it when they have a chance to, which may be at some future time. So the idea from Descartes is that whenever a human, animals don't have this of course, animals are you know, just uh, based in the here and now, in this model, uh, Descartes' model, uh, he uh, did not give any of the animals any kind of uh, intellect. Uh, they were essentially machines to him, they were machines based on survival. Uh, but for humans, you have you know this uh, reflective consciousness, and according to this model of the mind that Descartes had, whenever this reflective consciousness mind encounters new information or ambiguous information uh, and you have to decide whether or not this new information is true or if it's false then you, you perceive the information 
you understand the information as to what it's supposedly claiming, but you keep it in sort of a suspended animation until some later time when you, the mind, are able to uh, sit down and I guess the mind wouldn't sit, but uh, the mind would have to have some spare time to work on it to uh, rationally um, go over the details of this, this information and decide whether or not to accept it or reject it. So it's, you know, in Descartes' model, it, it's kind of a weird model when you think about it. It's like you've got this new information that comes into your awareness and you're not going to do anything with it until some later time <clears throat> when you can decide whether or not it's true or false. It would, it would seem to me that we'd forever be getting bogged down in trying to decide things as being true or false. And uh, what do we do in the meantime with the information? Do we just ignore it, act like it doesn't exist? So, I mean, it's, it's kind of a weird model, but it had some, apparently, had uh, quite a bit of appeal. Um, and you can, you can say that uh, much of the Western notion of reality is based on Descartes' model of the mind. Spinoza came along uh, a little bit after Descartes, Baruch Spinoza, and uh, he was an, another philosopher. He flatly rejected this model of the mind. He insisted that this is not how the mind works. And he put forward his own uh, theory of the mind, 1677. It's amazing that it's so old, and, and this, this model actually stands up pretty well in light of uh, uh, Dan Gilbert's research and other research. And what uh, Spinoza argued is that all ideas are accepted. Uh, that is to say that all ideas are mentally represented as true statements, unless and until a rational analysis causes them to become unaccepted. Now what we're talking about is new or ambiguous information that comes into your mind. If somebody tells you something that you already know flatly is wrong, you're not going to automatically accept it as being true. So, you know, we're, we're reserving this for that category of information that sounds plausible, but for which we don't have any evidentiary uh, background to consider. So if, we, if we're given some information about something that we're interested in, but we um, but we don't know whether that information is true or false. According to the Spinoza model, uh, that information is automatically accepted as being true information. And then later on, and, you know, it could be seconds or longer than that, or you know, whatever, days or weeks. I presume you would forget about it if it were that long. But um, after accepting the statement as being true, then you can do some rational analysis, maybe, uh, and that rational analysis could then tag it with a, um, a tag that says that it's false. You know, so it's a different model of the mind. Uh, in Descartes' model, everything is in suspended animation without a tag on it at all as to whether it's true or false until you do the rational analysis. Whereas in the Spinoza model, everything that comes in that's ambiguous is uh, automatically considered to be true unless you tag it as false and that secondary tagging takes the rational analysis part. So there are two different predictions about how we deal with new ambiguous information. And uh, as I said a minute ago, I think much of modern Western culture and thought is largely predicated on the Cartesian model of the mind the model developed by Descartes. Here's a figure from Gilbert Crawl and Malone's paper. I think the uh, Gilbert and Malone doesn't have this, this particular figure, the paper that I assigned for class. But this, this uh, illustration um, configures the, the two different models. And so you have the representation stage. This is where you uh, the this is where the mind is encountering the information. And um, you know, that's the stage at which you're understanding what the information is about. 
but you don't know yet whether it's true or false. So the representation stage is just merely knowing the information is there. It's, you know, as they say here, comprehension. And in the Spinozan model, you have both of these happening simultaneously, uh, comprehension and acceptance, and then later you have unacceptance of the information if it's false, if you decide that it's false. Whereas in the Cartesian model by Descartes, you have comprehension and nothing is decided about it until later as to whether you accept it or reject it. So two different things, two different ways in which we deal with information according to these two different models. Cartesian model predicts that when encountering new information the mind will hold back on making any decision about the veracity of the statement until the owner of the mind has a chance to rationally examine it. Whereas the Spinoza, Spinoza model predicts that when the mind is not given a chance to rationally examine new information, it will be accepted as true until you decide to examine the false information and unaccept, unaccept it. So two, two different hypotheses, two competing hypotheses. Unfortunate at that time, they did not have a scientific method in which they could actually test these, but we can, we can do it now. And that's what Gilbert did. That's what Dan Gilbert did. Uh, in a series of uh, clever experiments in this paper and others. By the way, I'll be posting this PowerPoint as well as the video lecture so that you can um, access all this information in different ways. So here, uh, this is from Gilbert Crawl and Malone, 1990. Subjects are told they will learn words in the Hopi language. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm still coughing quite a bit with the COVID-19. Trying to do my best. Uh, so again, here, subjects are told that they will learn words in the Hopi language in a study that the, the subjects are told that the experiment is a study on language acquisition, and that's why they're learning these words from the Hopi language. Uh, just in case anyone knew Hopi, these are not actually Hopi words. They're just nonsense words. But the subjects were told that they were from the Hopi language. And they did this on computer screens. Yes, they had computers back in 1990, but they were pretty primitive. Uh, but they could do things like flash words and a timer. Uh, so on a screen, they see statements followed by feedback regarding whether the statement is true or false. And the, the statements were the meanings of words, like a Goran is a jug, a Dinka is a flame, a Waliv is a bear, and a Tika is a fox. So some of these <coughs> Hopi words, allegedly Hopi words, some of these words were matched with a true meaning of the word, and some of the words were matched with a false meaning of the word. And then the subjects had to try to learn the language that way. And part of the cover story is that um, when the subjects were told, when you go to another country and you're learning the language, uh, often it's through trial and error where you're asking people about the words. And so that's why they had some false pairings. So sometimes the feedback states that the statement is true. Sometimes the feedback states that the pairing of word and meaning is false. For some of the pairings, feedback on the screen coincides with the second task. So we have two different uh, things going on here. And the second task involved hearing a tone. And whenever you hear the tone, you have to press a button. So half of the time, when they hear a word pair and they're told that it's true or false, uh, they also have to hear the tone and uh, press a button. And so this, this task is such that they can, they can see the feedback, but the, the secondary task is going to interfere with their cognition to such an extent that they uh, won't be able to uh, spend any time thinking about the truth or falsity of the word pair. 
So it's kind of a, you know, uh, an interesting technique and an unusual technique, uh, but it worked quite well for the task that they wanted to do. So because the tone interferes with the cognitive processing of the feedback that they're being given in terms of the truth or falsity, the reason why I put true slash false is because half of the time they're told it's true, half of the time they're told it's false. You know, we're talking about um, a large group of subjects. I don't know the sample size. Large group of subjects randomly assigned to the conditions. So because the tone interferes with the cognitive processing of the feedback, the prediction is that the errors in the direction of truth will share um, will show support of the Spinoza model of the mind. So let me rephrase that. If the Spinozan model is correct, then the errors that people make will tend toward errors of accepting the statement pairing is true. Because the Spinozan model of the mind says that we automatically accept things as being true unless we have a chance to rationally think about it. So the, the tone, the secondary task of the tone is eliminating the stage at which people would be able to rationally think about the information. Therefore, if you, if you eliminate the ability to um, unaccept through rational analysis, unaccept the, the information that you're given, you're going to automatically assume it's true. That's the Spinoza model. Whereas the uh, Cartesian model would have errors equally distributed in either direction. Half of the time people would guess true, half of the time false. So if there's a direction in terms of assuming truth for the statements, that would be evidence that the Spinoza model of the mind is the better model. So to more formally state the hypotheses, because we need to always have a clear hypothesis, if the Cartesian model is correct, subjects would have errors on all trials that were interrupted by tone and the errors would be randomly distributed. Whereas with the Spinoza model, if the Spinoza model is correct, subjects would have errors only on false pairs that were interrupted by tone and they should think that the false pairings are true. If you have a a pairing of words and the feedback is that this is a true pairing, if the Spinoza model is correct then you should have no errors on that because uh, when you're interrupted by the tone you'll still say that it's true and you'll be correct. So the, the, the you know what we're looking for here is substantial amount of error when uh, people are given um, a word pairing, a, a, a Hopi word with a meaning and they're told that it's false, and if the errors go in the direction of saying that it's true, that's evidence for Spinoza. The Spinoza model predicts that they automatically accept the word pair as true, and that the tone stops their cognitive processing, which would have enabled them to tag the statement as false. Here are the results. And so what we're looking at is the feedback that's false that the first letter here is feedback as to the uh, Hopi word with a meaning being declared uh, false or true. And this is what they report. This is what the subjects report. And you can see the interrupted, that's the group that gets the tone and has to press the button. So that's where you have the interrupted cognitive processing. And lo and behold, there's this huge increase, really substantial, uh, for, you know, you can see it's about, uh, what is that, uh, maybe 15% um, increase in subjects in, when they're interrupted and they have um, a word pairing that the feedback tells them is, <laughs> is false, 15% uh, more likely to declare it as true if the, if the tone is going off. So that's pretty strong evidence. That's one of, I think, three different experiments uh, that um, uh, the researchers reported in this paper. I'm not going to go over the other ones, just this one, to give you an example of flavor of the type of research that they were, that they were doing.
clever experiments. It seems to work. So, uh, Gilbert and his colleagues, in all, yes, they did have three experiments, and all three of them supported the Spinoza model of the mind, indica indicating that the mind operates by automatically accepting new information and then by unaccepting it if needed. And I, I particularly like this, you know, what can be more important? than understanding how the mind works when encountering new information. And, uh, you know, back then we had conspiracy theories in the 1990s, but nothing like what we have today. And uh, what could be more timely than to under understand why so many millions of people today seem to uh, endorse these really just crazy conspiracy theories? for which there's no real evidence. Anyway, so re <laughs> recall from the previous le lecture on social cognition, the work by Dan Kahneman, the System 1, System 2 processing that I referenced a little while ago. The Spinozan model of the mind fits perfectly here where System 1 processing is low effort and things that sound correct or true are just simply accepted as being true whereas System 2 processing takes mental effort. So System 2 in the Spinozan model would be the stage at which you rationally analyze the information to unaccept it. So it fits, uh, fits with this um, you know, late 20th century, early 21st century research uh, really quite well. If only uh, Spinoza were alive today to, to know that his model is carrying on. So all the absurd conspiracy theories in politics today fit with system one processing, in my view. There's not enough research on this. I think there needs to be more. And um, you know, I think a, a lot of what we see in terms of uh, the conspiracy theories adopted by large segments of the public is just a failure to seriously utilize system two processing to rationally go through the information. Conspiracy theories are said to be um, rational-like in the sense that uh, there's lots of detail and there's, there is a lot of thought that goes along with it, but it's just, it's filled with confirmation bias. Where confirmation bias is one of the cognitive heuristics identified by Tusky and Kahneman uh, in, in terms of uh, heuristic thinking. Heuristic thinking is taking shortcuts taking shortcuts in terms of coming to a conclusion that's not based on the full evidence. And, uh, you know, if, if you're a conspiracy theorist and you encounter me talking about, you know, why people believe in conspiracy theories, the, uh, you know, they would just come back and say that uh, I'm the deluded one uh, and uh, that I'm not considering all the facts. So, that, you know, they get very defensive about that. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to argue about it stuff like that. Let's look at some evidence. Now, again, there's not a whole lot of evidence in terms of uh, the how and why people believe in conspiracy theories. There's some out there, and I think there's more that's being developed. But there, there are a couple of different studies that I think uh, are good enough to, uh, to mention here that bear on this sort of thing. And I, I think it, it's a testament to uh, the Spinoza model of mind which is why I want to talk about it. So here's a paper by uh, Kristen Depp and colleagues, a whole bunch of colleagues. <clears throat> and so it's a fairly recent article, 2015, in the uh, Judgment and uh, <coughs> the Journal of Judgment and Decision Making. It's a journal where they do a lot of social cognition uh, publications. Uh, reflective liberals and intuitive conservatives a look at the cognitive reflection test and ideology. Now, if you remember from the social, social cognition lecture that I did, the cognitive reflection task, uh, test had uh, questions like a bat and a ball are together worth a dollar ten. The bat costs one dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? 
tricky questions, but they're not that, not that hard if you think about it. And if you recall anything about the test, you may recall that there are three different items. Uh, it's possible to get a square of zero, one, two, three, or four. Uh, so actually zero, one, two, or three. So it's a four point scale. It's possible to get zero correct, one correct, two correct, or three correct. One, zero, one, two, three. Four point scale. And the researchers here uh, found uh, in a series of experiments uh, that, uh, you know, in all these different experiments that they, that they did, con conservatives scored lower on the cognitive reflection test, test uh, with a small to moderate effect. And this was more pronounced for social conservatives than economic conservatives. What, uh, what's meant by social conservative is uh, conservatives are primarily concerned with uh, moral issues rather than economic issues. So, I, you know, it's interesting that the findings here are consistent, although it should be noted that other studies have failed to find a link. So, you know, uh, there's some diversity of findings within the research. Uh, there's a ton of research using the cognitive reflection test. And I don't know if anyone has done a meta-analysis on the uh, link of the CRT to uh, uh, con uh, conservative ideology. I looked, but I didn't see one. Uh, but I'm, I, I think there probably is one out there. I only spent a few minutes looking. So, you know, the, <laughs> the other thing is that the, the effect here is small to moderate. It's not huge, but it's, it's fairly consistent. Uh, or how about this one? Atheists and agnostics are more reflective than religious believers for empirical studies and a meta-analysis. The reason why I'm going through these is because I'm interested to know whether or not there's a link here in terms of conspiracy theories and um, <clears throat> willingness to unbelieve the unbelievable. Yeah, this is the heart of the Spinoza model of the mind. The, uh, the, willing, the, 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 the initial general acceptance of new information and then the later rejection of things as being false after a reflective period where you rationally analyze it. Well, I think the cognitive reflection test is probably a good stand-in for the ability of, that a person would have to rationally analyze information. It's, system, it's a good test of system two processing. So if we can see that there's a, a re relationship between the CRT, the cognitive refle reflection test, and conspiracy theories, then you know, we've got pretty good evidence. So knowing how the CRT works is uh, it's an interesting endeavor. So here, atheists and agnostics are more reflective than religious believers. Uh, and so they did four studies, I'll only go over, I think, one. Uh, this one. <clears throat> so in terms of the, the mean score on the ACS, analytic cognitive style, which is related to the uh, cogn cognitive reflection test. Cognitive reflection test was part of this more overall uh, scale of the, the cognitive style. What we see here is greater cognitive complexity less cognitive complexity as you know. And for uh, those who are religious, the score over here, <coughs> about uh, 0 0.4, uh, no, 0 0.37. And uh, you can see a linear trend with atheists being up here, about 0.52. So it's, it's clear evidence of greater cognitive complexity in thinking among atheists uh, than for those who are mother those who are uh, religious. Three different samples. Sample of uh, religious or theist individuals, that's 570N, 294 agnostics, and 200 atheists. So I guess, you know, you can say that we're developing this, this understanding in a so somewhat roundabout way. Uh, and uh, here in the same article, 
the authors did a meta-analysis. So these are all different studies. Penny Cook uh, does some really interesting work. I'm going to talk about Penny Cook a little more. Uh, current study 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, Jack et al. And so on. So you see lots of different uh, studies, each one giving an effect size. And what we see is the, uh, the relationship between uh, being uh, religious versus atheist and performance on the cognitive reflection test. test. So this would be no difference between religious and atheist. The red line I put in here is to make it uh, a lot more easy to see. And for every one of these, <clears throat> this is a confidence interval with the center point being the mean effect size for that study. The, the size of the square represents the sample size. So this one is a very small sample, whereas this one is a very large sample. You can see that across all these studies, there's a pattern <coughs> with those who are religious having a much smaller, uh, uh, or I should say much uh, lower performance on the cognitive reflection test. And these are correlations. So we're talking an average correlation. I think it's uh, 0.21. <clears throat> I'd have to go back and look at the paper again, but um, it's it's a clear pattern. So there's no doubt that this is, you know, something that's verifiable and repeatable. So those who are religious score worse on cogn cognitive reflection tests. They don't know <clears throat> or can't answer correctly the um, cost of the ball in the bat and the ball problem. Now, you know, I should mention too, though. <coughs> that um, what we're talking about here is not intelligence, not at all. It's the willingness to engage in rational thought. It's the willing, willingness to kick into motion system two processing to come to an answer. What is the opposite of that? System one intuit intuition. If you're, if you're willing to jump to the conclusion if you're willing to go with your intuition, that's system one processing. Uh, President Trump, by the way, uh, constantly says he uses his intuition rather than anything else to make decisions. He's rooted in system one processing. Uh, when, when I would hope that uh, he would be using system two. Okay, so next, here's another study by Penny Cook. I only really recently learned of Penny Cook's research, and uh, he's got a ton of studies, so I'll be looking forward to uh, reading some more of them. Some pretty clever um, methodologies in some of these studies. In this particular study, what uh, Penny Cook and his authors did is uh, he used the random phrase generator. So they took, it, I think it's a website that you can go to. Uh, if, you, if you're interested, in, you can look up this actual article and find out. Uh, I love the name of this. On the, on the reception and detection of pseudo-profound bullshit. I can say that because it's published in the title, right? Judgment and Decision Making. Um, so the, the, you know, what this website does, I think it's a website. What this site does is it takes sayings by Deepak Chopra and it jumbles them up. You know, so we're just randomly rearranging words used by Deepak Chopra to make new statements which ostensibly sound profound, but in fact when you think about it, they're just complete nonsense. Complete bullshit. So it's a clever methodology. I really like this one. <coughs> and uh, so we got several tables of correlations and I just want to focus on this first column here. So a variable number one is the, if you look up here, the bullshit receptivity scale. And that's a series of these meaningless statements that are created by the Deepak Chopra random aphorism generator. <coughs> All completely nonsense. And so that's variable one. And from this point down, these are all the correlations with these other things. 
and I highlighted some that were more important. So the willingness to accept something as being profound when in fact it's bullshit correlates with heuristic, heuristics and biases. So high score on heuristics and biases means that you are able to avoid heuristic thinking. Or let's see, so no, uh, hang on. Yeah, that's, that's correct, that's correct. So if you, if you scored high on acceptance of bullshit on the BSR, that means your performance in terms of avoiding heuristic thinking is worse. That means that you're using more cognitive shortcuts in the heuristics and biases scale. <clears throat> Interesting. See, I've not I've not used that one. I should take a look at that. But uh, we see it's a moderate effect. These are correlations. Remember, the 0.10 is small. 0.30 is medium. 0.50 is large. And then the next one that I highlighted is faith and intuition. We can call that the Donald Trump um, technique. He has uh, tremendous faith in his own intuition. So if you <clears throat> if you score highly on the bullshit acceptance scale, you are also more likely to have faith in intuition as a good way to solve problems. And I'll skip past some of these. They're interesting in their own, but you can read on them if, uh, if you're interested to look up the paper. The other one that I want to note is religious belief. And you see that uh, the acceptance of bullshit <clears throat> on the bullshit scale correlates moderately with religious belief. Now what I would really like to see here is a measurement of political ideology, but there is none in, the, in this particular study. You know, that's what I was looking for. Also the PB is paranormal belief. So I guess if you, if you believe in the bullshit, you're more likely to believe in flying saucers and astral projection and things like that. <clears throat> um, so yeah, there's no, there's no poli political ideology here uh, listed. There's no conspiracy theory endorsement listed here. Uh, you know, the, the main thing I'm interested in to tie it to uh, <clears throat> the uh, Spinoza model of the mind is, is really whether or not uh, system two processing helps you avoid uh, believing in conspiracy theories. So I'm looking for evidence of that. It's, uh, although, you know, you, and, and conspiracy theories today in the United States, I mean, the, people say that uh, those on both the right and the left endorse conspiracy theories. And yeah, sure, that's true, but my God, the conspiracy theories on the right, the political right, are just insane these days. And there, you know, there's some on the left, <clears throat> they tend to revolve around environmentalism and things like that. But, uh, I mean, it, you can't keep up with the weird conspiracy theories on the right wing. But, you know, whenever I think about that, I think I have to be careful about how I think about that because I may be blind to some of the left. And arguing about that stuff is, is useless because whenever you post a link to Snopes, they say, oh, well, I'm, I don't trust that site. Don't trust the fact checker. Huh, maybe my meds are making me loopy. I'm talking a lot. So let's see. Let's go on to the next one. So this is from the same study, the same uh, series of studies. I think each one had a different sample. So this one, the same bullshit scale, the bullshit receptivity scale, with fake Deepak Chopra um, uh, random number or random word generator uh, generated uh, aphorisms <clears throat> and you see that the, the receptivity to bullshit negative, negatively correlates with the CRT so the bat in the ball problem <clears throat> and the lily pond the lily the lilies in the pond uh, doubling in size uh, every day you know the three different problems on the CRT um, those who do worse on the CRT are uh, more accepting of bullshit with an R equals 0.33. So, you know, it's a moderate effect. And then you've got the, the measure of heuristic biases. Verbal intelligence is negative correlation with uh, 
Uh, so those who endorse the bullshit have lower verbal intelligence um, and religious belief <laughs> showing up again. And then a third one. <clears throat> this one, finally, they have conspiracist ideation. But this is not, you know, this is not a sample of people who believe in conspiracy theories. Uh, if my memory is correct, this was a sample of people who were obtained through Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is just, you know, people who uh, join the Amazon Mechanical Turk do small little tasks uh, for, you know, 50 cents or a dollar. <clears throat> so I think of this one, they paid them 50 cents for something that would take 10 minutes. <clears throat> so there's there's nothing nothing in the selection process that gave them a good strong base of people who believe in conspiracy theories. I think if you were able to get such a base of people, you would probably see a stronger correlation here. But there is a correlation between acceptance of bullshit and conspiracy ideation. Unfortunately, in this particular study, they did not use the CRT. So we don't get the correlation. This is what I was looking for, the correlation between the CRT and the conspiracy theory belief. Um, so, you know, it's close, but uh, uh, some more uh, studies uh, clearly can be done here. So what I wrote here to sum up this area of research, overall these various results support the contention that social conservatives and religious people tend to score lower on complex cognitive style. And this in turn correlates with heuristic biases, belief in the paranormal and conspiracy theory thinking. It also fits with the Spinozan model of the mind. <coughs> you know, the Spinozan model is that you uh, at first accept information, and then um, if you're willing to do so, you confront the information by rational analysis and reject it if it deserves to be rejected. I think they're just not doing that second part. And, you know, I also I should mention, I don't want it to sound like this is just the disparagement of, uh, of religion, but, uh, you know, the, the numbers here are pretty clear that um, uh, those who are religious tend to be more strongly rooted in system one processing and accepting the information rather than rationally thinking about it. So next up, and uh, I'm going to come back, going to go through some other research and then come back to um, the uh, Dan Gilbert stuff and the Spinoza model. Harold Kelly in 1967 proposed what he called the covariation theory. In uh, Kelly's covariation theory, what he tried to do was come up with a, a theory that would explain how people uh, look at somebody else and decide whether or not the behavior that's being exhibited by the other person represents an internal state like a disposition or whether it represents situational forces acting on the individual. <clears throat> so uh, his covariation theory was an attempt to explain how people make attributions, either personal or situational, about the cause of a behavior they observe in somebody else. Kelly assumed that we think rationally about others' behavior and that we strive for accurate assessments of the causes of those behaviors. And, um, you know, this is, uh, <coughs> this theory was proposed a long time ago, in 1967, this, uh, <coughs> this is really before the uh, revolution in research on uh, social cognition. And if anything should be clear to you from the research in social cognition, it's that humans do not think rationally all the time about, uh, about themselves or about others. Um, at any rate, so with Kelly's covariation theory, to the extent that behavior is diagnostic, when we view it, when we're, when we're looking at somebody else's behavior, to the extent that that information is diagnostic, uh, we can use that to make dispositional or situational attributions 
about the cause of that behavior? Is it because the person has a personality or something else internally that caused him or her to do the thing that they did? Or was it the situation that produced that behavior uh, in that individual that we're watching? Here's a graph that I put together. Um, it's similar to other graphs that um, have been made over the years to try to illustrate uh, Kelly's covariation theory. And the key thing here <coughs> is that when, when the observer looks at somebody, and we call that person the actor, in this case I call him Bob, when the observer looks at somebody and, and their behavior, what the observer is doing is looking at the consensus, the distinctiveness, and the consistency of that behavior and then they make their final attribution in terms of whether it's internal, i.e. dispositional, or external, situational. So in terms of consensus, with low consensus, and uh, so for this example, uh, Bob says something positive about a film. Uh, with <laughs> With low consensus, the comparison point is other people. Do other people say positive things about the film? So here, the consensus is low because Bob said something positive about the film, whereas everybody else <coughs> uh, says nothing about the film or negative things. So few other people offer positive reviews. So I'll just I'll go by the row. So I'll go along this row first. The distinctiveness issue. If it's low, uh, low distinctiveness, Bob gives positive reviews to all of the films that he sees. That would not give you sufficient information to um, to say that <laughs> that the film was particularly good, because if Bob <laughs> always likes films that he watches, <laughs> oh, I, got, I think I'm going to have to take a break. I'll come back later. What I'll do actually, I'm going to stop the recording here. Um, and post this part as part one and then part two I'll pick up from this spot and uh, so I'll hopefully get that up uh, online as well very soon. So this is part one, part two to be loaded separately.